the floor over to you, Mary. Okay, thank you. Um, and thank you uh, for participating in that introductory question. Uh, I'd, I'd never used that as a, a form of uh, icebreaker before. And I, so I was glad that I was asked to give a question for people to use uh, with their names. Um, it looks like we've got a good number of boomers and millennials here, but not so many Gen Xers, uh, which is interesting. I, I don't know what exactly what it says, but just interesting. We've got those two um, ends of the age spectrum, and that's actually where the most tension usually happens. And that's because they're the two biggest uh, demographic cohorts that we have in the workplace right now. Um, I would think uh, I'm a boomer, and I think uh, the biggest stereotype uh, that bothers me is this whole notion of uh, that we've, we're passing our due date, you know, that uh, we're, we're just not relevant anymore. And to me, actually, the fact that we have been around uh, makes us really relevant in certain areas for certain reasons. And uh, that's why we're going to, I know you're a Gen X, uh, Brenda, but you didn't tell us what gets in, the, what gets you mad about you being a Gen X. Couldn't find the question, Mary. I'll give myself oh. a guess. <laughs> All right, tell us. But I'll tell you the biggest um, stereotype about Gen X is slackers. Um, and that comes about because of people who uh, uh, are really good at work-life balance um, and are not going to work, uh, you know, 90 hours a week the way that boomer workaholics can. And so boomers tended to get very judgmental about why, what does it mean that you're not making your whole life about work the way that we do? And so again, um, misperceptions, not understanding each other. And so that's what these practices are about, um, getting the hang of why different generations uh, behave and perceive the world that they do, or the way that they do. So let me uh, bring up my screen. And do this. I'll help you vamp a little bit, Mary, while you're doing that in the background. And I want to welcome if anyone else joined late. Um, please use chat to communicate with each other. Reminder to drop your LinkedIn URL in chat. And as you have thoughts on Mary's talk, drop them into chat as well. We'll do QA and a conversation at the end. Um, I always like to help out the speakers as they're getting started. I found it's really hard to be piloting, co piloting, and keeping the audience going at the same time. So there you go, Mary. I've ramped you up. <laughs> Thank you. Perfect. Uh, let's see. Can I make? Uh, yeah. So we're talking about, oh, shoot. And now you might need to vamp again because it did not. I didn't bring up where I really wanted to start. OK, no problem. And Mary, I think okay. when you when you get to the point where you want to advance the slides, I think you just touch the screen or there might be like an arrow. I'm not sure if you know that in Zoom, it's a little different. Let me Thanks. know if you've got it or if you need any help. Got it. There you go. Perfect. All right. So here is what we're talking about with Gentelligence. Um, it is, it's, it's got two specific goals. Number one, we want to break down the barriers of the tension. And we named some of those barriers just now while building up the capacity to leverage our powers of different, being gener different generations um, to really use them uh, use these different perspectives to uh, create and innovate uh, some important wins in the organizations that we work with. A quick review of what we're talking about when we look at these uh, different generations. There can be up to five generations in the workplace. Not a lot of traditionalists, but there are still some people who are working uh, into their 70s and their 80s. Uh, the way that we identify these generations really has to do with significant historical events that took place um, as uh, these different cohorts were coming of age. So for instance, traditionalists grew up during the time of the uh, Great Depression and the Second World War. 
And these two events had a lot to do with forming their ideals, which had much to do with, uh, well, the patriotism and the being very conscious savers and uh, a focus on family and really people that would adhere to the rules that were seeking security and stability. Whereas their boomer offspring, we came in the, into the world during a time of great optimism. Um, it's the space age, economic boom, this sense of the world is our oyster. We can, we, we thought, you know, we can become who we want to become, but we're going to have to work hard to get there. We bought into our parents' work ethic that you go into the workplace and you play by the rules, you pay your dues. We wanted more, um, uh, immediate gratification, though, we're the uh, generation that really brought in this idea of credit cards, uh, buy now, pay later. Uh, so we were more into material things than our parents were. Gen X, a uh, big part of their formation comes from coming into the world after the a big economic boom. Things were no longer quite as um, explosive in terms of optimism and possibility. And their biggest uh, formation events were twofold and they were social. One, divorce was no longer taboo. So we have more single parent homes than we ever had before. And the second is a big uh, movement towards women going to work meaning mothers going to work, some out of necessity because they were single parents, some because the time had come for them to have their own careers. So this was a generation of latchkey kids, uh, very independent, very self-sufficient. And so what uh, they were known for coming into work is eye on the prize, here to do what I need to do. I want to work effectively. I expect to be paid well but I am not making work my life. I am going to have probably the family life uh, that I didn't get to have in terms of spending time with children um, and, and enjoying family um, in a way that maybe I didn't get to. So this is a, a different way of approaching work. Millennials born to the boomers, but born to optimists during an optimistic time. So we get a double, you know, kind of whammy of, ooh, here we go. Uh, millennials born to parents who have a fair amount of discretionary income, parents who are very devoted to making sure that their children have the best that they're able to provide. Uh, I call millennials the big disruptors. And I mean that in a good sense because these, um, People had access to all kinds of technology early on. And I say the biggest tool for this disruption was that little ha handheld computer known as, you know, the um, iPhone uh, came on the scene in 2007. So many things you can do and so many things you can do immediately information, making contact, solving problems. And so when we talk about this generation, you know, wanting that, again, immediate gratification, well, why not? Because I can do so much and get so much quickly. Um, isn't that just how the world works? And um, idealistic people, people who want to make a, a good positive impact on the world and who because, however, parents tended to um, intervene and helicopter did not always get to learn about um, the importance of merit. I will say having to learn things the hard way. Parents didn't always give them a chance to do that. And so that's where some remedial work has had to happen in the workplace. Gen X coming on the scene now, uh, have more in common with their traditionalist great grandparents than with any other generation uh, in between. These uh, young people were born in the shadow of 9-11, grew up in during the great recession, 
went to school practicing uh, for active shooter, um, you know, doing active shooter drills uh, and, uh, you know, constant growing uh, fears about climate change and what that means. In other words, this generation has really not had much time in which they've ever felt like the ground was very solid beneath their feet. And one thing we know for sure is that about every, almost every member of this generation has at some time, if not now, been on a, some form of antidepressant or anti-anxiety med. And this is real. And so it's incumbent on all of us in the older generation to be aware of this and sensitive to it. Doesn't mean that this isn't a resilient generation with a lot to offer, but for us to help them transition into adulthood with a sense of confidence uh, is, is really very, very important. And a couple of people mentioned they're in HR and I say HR, make sure that your mental health uh, services are every bit as uh, robust as anything you do for physical health. Okay, so that in a nutshell, this is who we're talking about and why these differences come to be. It's a different world that each one of us grew up in. So what are these practices we're talking about? And by the way, Brenda, you're gonna have to just tell me to stop when it's time, whether we get through it all or not. Carrie, we've but, got about uh, about 20 minutes left, if that'll help you. From oh, the well, then we're going to be fine. If you could leave a little bit of time for Q&A, that'd be helpful. Thank you. Yeah. So when, in a nutshell, this is what we want to do. We want to start, you know, right now at the beginning, resisting any temptation we might have to stereotype. We want to resist assumptions. We want to learn how to adjust the lens, how we're viewing other people, to strengthen our trust with each other and expand the pie, which of course, those of you who know Brenda, know that I had to illustrate with a little pie. How do we make the pie bigger? So phase one, first thing we've got to do is to break down barriers between each other. So resist assumption means that every time that we've got this feeling of, you know, implicit bias, what I think I already know about you, just because of your generational identity, which by the way, our generational identity is only one part of the, our identity as a whole. We've got to push back on those biases, push back on those uh, stereotypes and push back on people who are, are you know, outwardly making those um, biases known or stereotyping within the group. But how are we gonna do that? One way is to conduct assumption audits and actually have a little a, a format that you can use like for one week, every day at the end of the day, write down one incident in which you found yourself wanting to assume something about somebody based on your, their age. Oh, of course, that's the way millennials do it. And we do have those things. We really truly do. Our job right now is to get them up and bring them to the surface. Of course, a boomer would think that way. Of course, they would say something like that. But what is it I'm assuming that makes that true. Why am I assuming that's true? And again, what, what might be a different way of looking at that? And one of the best ways to replace these assumptions is to intentionally go out of your way to make personal connections. And when you think about these, these stereotypes that we have, are they really fulfilled or are they acted out by the people that you know? 
that live, you know, that, that belong to these different um, generational categories. For instance, based on the boomers that you met even today, I don't think you're going to meet anybody that's resistant in, in a boomer that's resistant to change, probably by virtue of the fact that we're all here and in form means we're interested in change. We're interested in learning about new things. And it seems to me like we're all very um, active in, in wanting to adapt to new ways of doing tech. We might need some different ways of, of being able to learn about it, but we do want to be tech savvy. We heard some millennials say today, I want to learn from other generations. I don't fit that assumption that says, I'm not curious about anybody other than myself. The practice, the second practice here is about learning how to look at a situation or look at another person, their intent through kind of through their eyes. This is really about building some empathy and asking yourself, I wonder why they're doing something based on what I know about their generation, even that snapshot of history. I wonder what motivates them to act the way they do. Where are they coming from? Before, again, I jump to a conclusion. How do we do this? This DIE approach? Describe the behavior that you're seeing. Again, note what I automatically, how I automatically interpret it. And then again, just like assumptions, what are some alternative evaluations for what is being experienced? For instance, can we understand the disconnect? Have any of you been in situations where someone's just typing on a laptop during a presentation? And you can go ahead and, and answer about this. I know as a boomer, I started out, and, and as a teacher, I started out thinking that when I saw my students on laptops, that they were clearly you know, playing games on it or, or typing emails or messages to each other. It took me a while to figure out they were actually taking notes. I could not figure out that there was um, kind of like legit reasons <laughs> for being on a laptop. And it's the same thing in meetings. Don't assume that they're not, uh, that a younger gen person is not listening, uh, is not act really actively participating. They might even be looking up the answer to some questions that are being posed. It does not mean disengagement. Or to a younger person, what, what does it mean when an older person asks for a hard copy document? Does that just mean they're trying to make your life difficult? That they don't understand that this is a waste of uh, resources? Well, I don't even know if I can explain it. But for me, there is something about being able to hold on to a hard copy when I'm reading. I, is it the angle? Is it that I'm not as accustomed to reading on screen? Is it that I can make notes on the paper itself? I can go back, I can revisit, I can think. I believe it just has a lot to do, again, with how I was raised, how I grew up and how I process information. Now, I'm also capable of downloading from a, a computer, you know, and reading it myself uh, or, or making the hard copy myself, but sometimes the boss will ask for hard copy. And it, it doesn't hurt to adjust the lens and try to understand why that actually might be useful for some people. And this whole business of, of uh, after work, um, you know, texting or communication, I think this is a real need for cross-generational, first of all, for teens to get real clear on what are the rules, what's the structure, when and how do we communicate with each other, and what are our time um, constraints. Because one thing I know, I do know by adjusting the lens 
is that younger generations are kind of a little more 24 seven in terms of being open to communication. I will say for me, um, you know, I come from a world where, you know, work is over, being at the office is over, you know, between five and six, at least my brain is shut down, whether you see me or not, and I'm not processing information. And therefore, even if I'm home, please do not try to talk to me after dinner. I won't understand what you're saying. And I'm certainly not in the mood to talk back to you. I will talk back to you in the morning, no problem. So do I feel insulted because you send me a text at 9, 10, 1 in the morning? I don't know. That can be personal. But can we at least acknowledge that sending me a text after hours is not a sign of disrespect? It means you're just cooking with gas and something's come to your brain and you need to say it now. Does the fact that I don't respond to it, and I might even ask you to hold it till the next morning, does that mean I disrespect you? No, but we got to, again, adjust the lens to see why do we have these different perceptions of communication or any of these situations? And neither is good nor bad. They're simply different. So let's say we've, we've done some work, you know, in that we're no longer just judging who's in, who's out. We're letting go of that. But how do we build up now these powers that can come when we can uh, put difference together in the room? And we have got to begin by strengthening our trust, being able to trust each other. We say, well, we don't wanna be afraid of each other. This is good, but how can we really come to trust each other, to know that I can say, share my opinion, even ask for help and not be afraid of the put down, um, being um, ignored, again, being judged. Well, here's what Gentelligence says. Uh, Gentelligence takes this notion of building trust in the workplace very seriously. This notion of psychological safety it has to be real. And uh, Gentelligent workplaces will use uh, formal tools that can help measure it. In other words, give the members of your team a, a survey that they can take. There's a number of them out there, even online. Um, I think one is even called Google Work that you can download for free. And the thing that the manager wants to do is look at the results, doesn't have to be based on person, but based on generation. Are you seeing that boomers feel safer than younger gens? Do younger gens feel safer than the older gens? And you need, everybody needs to know about these results and needs to talk about it. If we all feel safe, whew, good, we're on to the next you know, line of business. If none of us are feeling safe, we better find out why and what we can do about it because we can't go anywhere until we know that we um, well, can trust each other. Another way to establish this trust, and I think this is, is where kind of the rubber meets the road, is can we answer these questions together? Do we understand that everybody on our team can, we can count on each other, yes, but specifically, what can I count on you for? What can you count on me for? What is my specific purpose on this team? What's my specialty? What's my expertise? Every one of us have something unique that we can offer. 
And you see, it's not just based on seniority. It's based on what is our gift? What is our specialty? Have we named that? Have we identified that? Can we accept that? And, and what is our purpose together as a team? What do we wanna be known for or as? And what kinds of things do we need to do to, to tweak the way that we work so that we can really achieve that purpose? You know, we're the team that, that problem solves, that collaborates, that gets it done. You know, we exceed expectations. We're, we're not caught up in, in petty um, quibbles. We're known as the one people that we really do respect each other and have fun getting there. I'd like to be known as the team that gets it done while having fun. <laughs> Oops, not too fast. And here it is, intelligence practice number four. Let's stop the competition. We're not competing for who's the best generation, you know? But that idea that every generation brings unique gifts to the party. Generally speaking, we need the younger generation to bring those new and innovative ideas, whether there's things that they just learned in college that are emerging practices, whether they are things that they're picking up from, um, uh, you know, uh, social, emerging social practices, they're seeing uh, what's happening in the marketplace. Uh, among their generation. Again, sometimes they're, they're just on the forefront of new uh, tech innovations. Let's, let's savor that. Let's be thrilled about that. I mean, sometimes I watch the way that, that my kids think. I feel like they come up with new ideas just during breakfast, just for fun. They just are innovators. And that does not mean that older generations are not capable of innovating, but it sure helps to have this, this young energy to come in and support that. What are the older generations best at? They are best at helping take these new ideas and making them become reality because we've been around a while, because we've had a number of, of um, you know, trials, errors, oops got to do that different. We kind of do know about how to make things, you know, whether it's working in the system, whether it's just working through physics. Um, how can you take it and use some life experience to, to give it legs and to help make it successful? This is what helps young talent make it and last and become the people that we want them to be. But young talent has to know that older gens have their back. We want them to succeed and we're there to help. Get this idea that just because I'm helping you succeed, you know, does not mean that I lose. You know, then this idea of expand the pie, it comes from, it's a, um, negotiations phrase. They use it in negotiations. We can find the win-wins. That's what we're looking for, for everybody to find some kind of win when problem solving. So if we can stay focused on what it is, again, why are we here? What is it we all want to get out of this situation? and what each of us can do to help make that happen, rather than hunker down on this is my position and I'm not gonna give an inch until I get my way. And this encourage intergenerational learning and this ask me about exercise is again, it's another kind, you can use it initially as an icebreaker, but let's say if we were going around the room, 
um, the, the statement or the question you would ask uh, following giving your name would be, ask me about, and you would finish the question with something you are really good about, or, or really good at, um, a personal thing. Like I could say, you know, ask me about uh, how to make uh, the best cinnamon rolls in the county. Uh, in other words, I'm letting you know I am really good at cinnamon rolls. And that then could become, you know, a conversation starter for later. Somebody else can, you know, ask me about, and you think of what, how you would fill in the blank. Um, collage making, you know, something to do with gardening, but something that you feel good about that you like doing and you feel like, yeah, I could help teach you to do some of that. And when you start finding out that everybody's got an expertise in some area, we've really got some information we can exchange. And guess what? It's not based on my age. It's not based on my status. It's not based on how I look. It's based on what I do, on what I know. And this long-term version has to do with when we start going around again or another time, or this we could even put into a, uh, an info bank, ask me about, and this is something really, something that I do really well when it comes to our discipline, you know, what it is we do at work, you know, am I really a whiz bang, you know, when it comes to, you know, Excel spreadsheets or you, you know better what that expertise would be than I do. In other words, am I your go-to person? Can I help you with this? And then you begin to know who you can ask for help. We're all teaching each other. We're all leading each other. And we're all feeling like it's okay to get help from each other. Hey, Mary, I'm going to jump in real quick because we're going to just do a quick closing comments for those that do have to end by nine. And then I'll turn the floor back over to you and let you finish your talk and we'll do Q&A. Is that okay? Yep. Mm -hmm. All right, perfect. All right, Deb, I'm going to turn the virtual microphone over to you um, just to give us our closing comments and then we'll turn the floor back over to Mary again. Okay, great. Thank you, Brenda and Mary. Thanks everyone for attending. Uh, Mary, great information. And I can see a lot of areas that we all could use. I'm sure the questions after this will be great. Um, remember, if you did sign up to the inform site, to um, try to do that or message Andrea. And then don't forget about downloading our new app. That's kind of a fun way to get instant access to all of our meetings. And we need speakers for future meetings. So um, if you're interested in that, you can email us, email Brenda, we'll get a form out. Um, a variety of topics are good. So we welcome all different ideas. And next month's meeting is March 10th. So. Same thing, second uh, Thursday of the month, and uh, we look forward to having you then. Okay, Mary, back to you. Well, thank you. So I kind of flashed a couple screens while we were listening because, well, we can be multi, we can multitask around here. But if you would like um, any more information on this, please um, connect with me on LinkedIn send me an email, connect through my website, any way at all. I love talking about this. And this is the kind of training that I do, especially with intergenerational work teams. And uh, with that, I will stop sharing. And any questions, comments,